Hi, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mateo Chavez Lewis, and welcome back to Music Theater Theory. Whoa! Now, I've been away from the channel for a while. If you want to hear about why that is, sign up for my email list, link in the description. If you don't want to hear about why that is and you just want to get right into the music, that is great because that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Till I Hear You Sing today. This is from Love Never Dies, the ill-fated sequel to The Phantom of the Opera. There are plenty of spicy takes on the internet about this show, Love Never Dies. Um, but regardless of my opinion on uh, the overall quality of the show, I think that this song has a quite beautiful melody and is really, really, really fun to sing. So we're going to look at it today and figure out how it succeeds so well in building to its epic climax. It starts like this, very softly. And basically what's happening here is we just have these major chords that are just moving up and down um, in root position through diatonic chords from the key of F major. So there's really nothing too revolutionary happening in this intro here. I, for one, don't love when we get a bunch of triads in root position, one after the other. Root position means um, they're not inverted, so the bottom note is the note that the triad is built off of. Here we've got an F major triad, and the bottom note is an F, so that's root position. Here we've got a G minor triad, the bottom note is G, so that's root position. And then here we've got a C major triad, and the bottom note is C, so that's root position. And in general, when you're trying to construct a, a line out of chords, you want to use inversions so that you don't always have the root note on the bottom. When you do have the root note on the bottom, it can feel kind of robotic. Like, listen to this. Compared to if I were to play something with inversions, it would sound more like... You know, there's just a little bit more um, emotional content when there are inversions being used. So I don't love the fact that there's no inversions here, but the emotional content starts coming strong here at bar nine when the singer comes in because we get this melody. The day starts, the day ends, time crawls by. Night steals in, pacing the floor. The moments creep, yet I can't bear to sleep till I hear you sing. And weeks pass and months pass, seasons fly. Still you don't walk through the door. And in a haze I count the silent days till I hear you sing once more and then we go into the bridge so so far we're getting the foundations of a classic a a b a song form we get the the melody comes in the main melody that's the a melody then we get a repeat of it here and weeks pass and months pass so second a melody a a and now here we're going somewhere totally different um, and that's going to be our B melody. So we're setting us up for a very traditional song form. Um, and we as the audience already have a preconceived notion of how a song in this form is going to build. And I'll show you how this song adheres to that and how it deviates from that to surprise us. The thing I want to really point out about the construction of the melody itself um, as you no, probably. This song is sung by the Phantom of the Opera. And the Phantom of the Opera was the title character in another musical called The Phantom of the Opera, written by Andrew Lloyd Webber as well. Uh, the, the music was written by Andrew Lloyd Webber as well for that. And in The Phantom of the Opera, of which Love Never Dies is a sequel, 
the Phantom sings a song called Music of the Night. And that's the song that the Phantom sings when he's trying to, like, seduce Christine. And it goes... Nighttime sharpens, heightens each sensation, bum, bum, stirs and wakes imagination. Whatever the, the words are. But what I want to point out to you is the melody and the similarities between that melody and this melody that you're seeing here. Um, crucially, if I put them in the same key, this is how Music of the Night sounds in F major. So we start with A down to C, and then we get G down to C, then we get this moving line, and then we end on a C up the octave. The construction of this melody, we start with G down to C, and then we get A down to C, then we get a moving line, and then we end on C up the octave. So it's very similar in its construction to Music of the Night. It's just that the phrase where G goes to C and the phrase where A goes to C come in the opposite order. Do you see how that works? Nighttime is the same as time crawls by. And then nighttime sharpens is the same as the day starts, the day ends. Then we get... Um, uh, oh my god, I'm getting the two songs confused in my head now. Nighttime Shepherds. That is equivalent to Night Steals in Pacing the Floor, and it ends on the same note. So there's a lot of slight similarities to the way music of the night is constructed. They are not the same melody. They are not even conceivably variations of the same melody, but there are elements of the melody and the way the melody is constructed that are very, very similar, which just serves to anchor this in the phantom that we know and love. It serves to connect the phantom in the sequel, Love Never Dies, with the phantom that we already know from the original Phantom of the Opera. The other thing I love about this is that the hook of the song, the main lyric, the title of the song, and the last lyric of all the verses, and the end of the melody, the melodic line, is Till I hear you sing once more. But the first time we hear this melody, it cuts short, and we just jump straight to the next verse, here. Um, bear to sleep till I hear you sing, and then instead of going once more, it goes, and weeks pass and months pass, we just skip it, and we save it for later, so that when we finally get it here, it's a very satisfying sound to end on that F when the last verse didn't end on the F, it didn't have that resolution. Now we go into the bridge, and the bridge takes us into um, basically A minor here with that B natural. But crucially, B natural is borrowed from F Lydian, so this is the F Lydian scale. And Lydian has a reputation for being a very dreamlike scale. And the F Lydian scale has that B natural, so now that we're using this B natural, it feels a little bit like F Lydian. And he's singing about dreams when we go into this dreamlike scale. And sometimes at night time I dream that you are there, but awake, holding nothing but the empty air. There's some weird shifts here. Um, we've got the B natural here, but this is a B flat because there's no accidental and there's a B flat in the key signature. So that's a B flat, but this is a B natural. So we're, we're kind of shifting back and forth between scales. Um, we're pivoting a lot of the time on the A here, which is shared between the Lydian scale and the major scale with the B flat. Um, and then here we even get this E flat, which is borrowed from like the Mixolydian scale or the Dorian scale. Um, a lot of these uh, scales have a flattened seventh degree, which are all kind of darker sounds than the major scale. So we've got this very bright Lydian dreamlike sound. He's dreaming about Christine, but then that's contrasted with this E flat, which creates this dark sound um, 
I guess that represents his rage and his angst about the fact that Christine doesn't want to be with him. Then we get a repeat of the same thing. Um, Till I hear you sing once more. This is very interesting. The first time we hear this, it's sing once more, all the way down to the C. The second time we hear it, it's sing once more, only down to the D, so it doesn't go down as far. And then, the final time we hear it, it's going to be up the octave, till I hear you sing, but then it's going to stay on the S, so it's not going to go down at all. Once more! So it's interesting how just that note once builds throughout the song. It goes the first time, then the second time it goes that's the second time, and then the third time it goes that's the final time. Um, so it's really interesting how that one note change in the melody just keeps the stakes rising, keeps the tensions rising, keeps the emotion rising. Then we get our bridge section again. So now we've had our full AABA form, right? We've had our first melody, our A melody. Then we've had a repeat of it here. Then we get our bridge section. And then we come back to our A melody. So that's our full A, A, B, A. But now we extend it so we get an extra B and an extra A, and these ones build even higher and louder, and we end up with the phantom singing up the octave. <clears throat> and music, your music, it teases at my ear. I turn and it fades away, and you're not here. Let hopes pass, let dreams pass, let, <coughs> let them die. Without you, what are they for? I'll always feel no more than halfway real Till I hear you sing once more Boom. It's this huge, huge, huge climax at the end there um, <clears throat> that I have not warmed up enough to sing, clearly. <laughs> um, but what I love about it is that even when the melodic line resolves, the piano doesn't, right? Here we have, let them die. And the, the vocal line lands on that C, which is a part of the F major chord. Um, or it's also part of the C major chord that leads to the F major chord. So no matter whether it's going to F or C, that C is still a resolved note. But then the piano takes us to this other place where we get this like B flat major seven underneath it where the C is not a part of that chord at all. We get this chord in the piano and the singer is singing this note. Do you see how that clashes visually? Like these two notes are just right next to each other. Die. And then finally we get a resolution here. On without you, what are they for? Um, and then the same thing happens here. The singer goes all the way up to that high B flat. Till I hear you sing. And you expect it to go once more. Boom. End on that F major. And that's where the vocals go. But it's not where the piano goes. The piano gives us this weird B flat major 7 again. Which then, do you hear how crunchy that is with those two notes right next to each other? And then we get... this like B flat chord over a C in the bass, which then finally takes us to the F major chord. So the singer is singing the F, which is resolved, which is final, while the piano resolves around the singer. So we get once more, and everything else is still chaos around, and then it settles. More. That is the big climactic ending of the song. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Make sure to subscribe for more videos all about music theater and the music theory behind the great works of musical theater. 
and I will see you very, very soon. Once again, my name is Mateo Chavez Lewis, and this has been Music Theater Theory. Whoa. Peace out, y'all. See you in the next video.